All right, everybody, everybody, you with your main man, Anthony Brogdon, and whoa, my Nelly, I got a lady on the channel. I'm super excited. Let me tell you something. The backdrop of the story goes like this. I found her somewhere, somehow, and and and, and I, I, there were other people who said, hey, this is the right lady. Somebody else in another video, right, for what she wants to talk about, and you'll hear it shortly. And so I hit her up. She says, okay. And then I know she vetted me a little bit. You know, sometimes, hey, who is this guy? You know what he's talking about? She vetted me and whatnot. Saw some of the videos on the channel and said, yeah, I'll come on on. So the other day, we were, re we were ready to go. We were sitting here together. She on her side of the United States. I'm on mine because I do the videos via Zoom. And she couldn't hear me. And I'm like, oh, man, I hope that she does not say I don't want to do this because I can't hear you. And here she is a couple of days later to bring this history to you. I am coming up with some people who really want you to know this. Let me I, I somehow. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm Anthony Brogdon, everybody. Because <laughs> I had to get it off my heart. How excited and impressed I am that she's on the channel. I, I'm finding these people and they come on here. They got good stories, as you can tell, if you've been watching me, I come up with a few questions. And, and you see, we over 270 videos strong. New ones are posted every week. Did you see the one I just posted with the lady who, she said she just happened to look in her background and found out that there was some uh, black people in their family and that she's Creole? She took the mantle and now she's president of the Creole Association in Mobile, Alabama. And she explains what Creole is. Oh, oh my God. Did you see the one I got on there? Now, now you know, uh, the Juneteenth has really exploded as a, as, as a holiday that people recognize and celebrate and have Black history activities. But I got a couple people on the video on the channel that say, hey, we don't really deal with Juneteenth. We deal with 8th of August. I said, 8th of August, what's that? They said, that's when Andrew Johnson, who later became president, freed his slaves. I said, really? She said, we've been celebrating it for years, just in that Tennessee, Kentucky area. I said, oh, that's a good one. Did you see the video on the channel where the guy, this is early 1900s, He's a wealthy African-American brother in the insurance agency. He got so much money, he want to have his agents go on a vacation and, you know, network and whatnot. My man buys a bunch of land on a beach on an island off South Carolina. It's called America Beach. And, I, and, and I know his daughter. And they're still hanging. They're still hanging on the beach. Did you see that one? How about this one? Did you see the one? I got the great, great granddaughters of a guy who was enslaved. He knew how to work iron and carve iron and, you know, metal, metal or whatnot, excuse me. He got his freedom and opened up a car manufacturing company, 1905 in Greenville, Greenfield, Ohio. Watch that one. Oh, we got good ones on here. Did you see the one lady out of Lagos, Nigeria? For the time thing to work up, we did that interview. It was 7 a.m. my time. Watch that one. Oh, we jamming. Hey, come to my festival, everybody. I'm having my own Black History Festival. Little old me, I'm not little no more. Especially because this lady's on the channel. And it's May 27th through the 9th in Kansas City, Kansas. Look at the video I got on there about the guy whose great-great-grandfather escaped from Missouri, ran across the Missouri River, and ended up in this area called Quindaro. That's what got me thinking about it. And we really moving on this festival. Uh, how about this? Watch my movie. I'm, I, I produced this film. I hired the crew, wrote it, directed it, and found the people... And uh, for 75 minutes, we talked about slaves who went to college and black millionaires in the 1800s. It's in the movie and it's streaming on Amazon. And 
I got the book out. It's called Black Business Book. It does similar to the movie. It's got over 200 facts. And let me tell you something. If you know everything in this book, I'll give your money back. A book with a money back guarantee. <laughs> and every 10th book I sell, I donate one to a school. So I probably have donated somewhere around, I don't know, uh, 200 books. Just pick schools randomly and send them one. And say, y'all need to teach the kids this. So uh, go to my website, businessintheblack.net. And that's where all this is at. Uh, you hear me use this term strong a lot. And strong is a favorite word of mine. Uh, strong inspirations. Inspirations by strong at Gmail is the email address. I wish I lived on strong street. I just like it. And strong stands for strength tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that is my introduction to my guest today. Watch out, she's a strong lady <laughs> coming on in. Uh, introduce yourself. Thank you for being on Strong Inspirations. Well, thank you for having me, Anthony. And congratulations on your book and your video. And that's wonderful that you're donating it to the school. So. Oh yeah, they need to hear thank this. You. So tell us well, your name. I'm Jane Landers. I'm a professor of history here at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, but I grew up in the Caribbean. I ended up in Florida for my education. And you're talking about American Beach. Um, let me just show you real quick. Okay. I don't know if you can see this, but this is me with uh, Mavine yeah. Betch. Yeah, that's right. She's the daughter of the gentleman you spoke of. And that's right. she amazing wonderful friend uh you know this is us at the kingsley plantation in florida yes yeah and um so Mavine and i met through my research on the african history in florida and i work a lot with archaeologists and public history groups and of course i have to publish books and do all of the scholarly stuff too but Mavine was a wonderful wonderful lady yeah that, and, the um, lady on the channel she talks about her and we miss and her, her hair yeah. and whatnot uh, yeah for when i went to hug her i wasn't sure you know there was this big thing on her back and it was all her hair wrapped up because yeah. she was really into nature and not allowing you know to be cutting her hair or fingernails and she'd have you know yeah shells and things she wanted to protect the beach that her father you know made famous and yes. uh for retirement and and uh you know vacations for african-american families when they That's couldn't right. go to white beaches and yeah. she's a what was a wonderful woman an opera singer yeah, that's what they, uh, that's what they trained in Germany there. and just a, a wonderful, wonderful lady. And I'm and, and, blessed and to meet her. Is you said the Kingsley Plantation. Uh, yeah, I, I got the I got the lady who uh, is on the National Park Service who talks about that. OK, well, I, I've done a lot of research on that place as well. Um, and on Anna Magigini Jai, who was the Senegalese woman who was a, enslaved and bought in Cuba and Zephaniah Kingsley made her his wife and she became the plantation mistress there. Yeah, that's right. To, yeah, Dan Schaefer's the main scholar on that, but he and I went to Senegal looking for her trails, you know, um, many years ago. Oh, really? so, so I work a lot in Florida, but also what they call the Gullah Geechee Corridor. Uh, from South Carolina, Georgia, Florida on down. Yeah, yeah. We, I just had a lady on the channel who's Gullah Geechee out of Charleston. Okay, yeah. yeah I'm working that. a lot with the folks in Charleston there. We're about to have a, an anniversary next year um, of a great rebellion there that I write about called the Stono Rebellion. When I heard some, about that, yes. Yeah, the slaves are rise up and... and uh, create a rebellion and they're headed down the road a piece. The wonderful book by Peter Wood uh, called Black Majority was the first book about that. Uh, and he he did a wonderful job and he became, you know, sort of my instructor as well. Uh, oh, but, tell us about the, about the uh, rebellion. What happened? Well, the rebellion happens in 1739 because in 1738, the place that I wrote my first book on and my dissertation book uh, was a place called Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mose, but in English they just say Fort Mose. 
Okay, but what was, was that? Yeah, I got them on the channel. Okay, well, yes, because Thomas Jackson, I think, right. may have been how you found me. Yes. He's an old friend of many years. Yes. Uh, but so here, that's what I did for my dissertation work. And I tracked all the Spanish records in Cuba and Spain about these people. And um, they ran from the beginning in 1687, we started seeing runaways from the English uh, plantations, or they really weren't plantations yet, but mm -hmm. in South Carolina. And they're going with indigenous help down to Spanish Florida because that's the first Underground Railroad is south. Right. right. Um, as long as they could cross that international border and get into the Spanish terrain, they uh, would be freed. They had to become Catholics. Right. Um, some of them already were. If they came from Congo, uh, they were probably already Catholic. And uh, then they get free land. They make a town. They have their own black militia. And I'm writing the biography now of the man who was the captain of the area, who was a man when he gets baptized in the Catholic Church, they call him Francisco Menendez. But I don't know what his African name was. I don't know what they called him in English. I don't know what they called him uh, when the Yamasee War broke out in Carolina in 1715. He fought with them for two years before he came into Florida. Okay, so, well, you're giving us a lot. Let me, I, I want to tackle it in little pieces, though. Now, okay. so what happened in that stowaway rebellion? This, this kind of. Well, it's called Stono, S T O N O, for okay. the name of the river. Okay. Um, they rise up. There's about 29 or 30 of them. They uh, they killed some of the whites and left some alive if they'd been good to them. Uh, they go down the road. So the Peter Wood book says they're going down the road and nobody knew what happened to them except then I find them coming into Florida. Oh, so and, they weren't killed. They weren't captured. Anyway. Well, yeah, a lot of them were killed, unfortunately. Um, but right after this happens in the Black baptism records of the Catholic Church that I uh, go around preserving in digital form, and there's a big archive online if anybody wants to look called the Slave Society's Digital Archive. Uh, you just look up slavesocieties.org and there it is. Anyway, all the oldest church records for Blacks in this country, uh, starting in the 1590s, mm. are there. So Black Catholics from 1590, and also the oldest for the indigenous people in what is today the United States, are up on that website from St. Augustine, Florida. That was the first European town in the United, what's today the United States. So. Mm. They had this plan already for converting indigenous groups and giving them land and housing. No, and have you use that word indigenous. What does that mean? Indian, I'm sorry. Right, okay, okay. For or Native everybody. American, you could use all of these terms. Okay. But if they were converting, the Spaniards were trying to convert them as well. They would give them a town. Uh, they would post a priest there to evangelize them. They would baptize them. So all the records are there. And when these runaways came in from South Carolina and they were African, they did the same thing with them. They're new converts, give them land, give them a village, uh, give them a priest, um, you know, give them a militia, let them elect their own leaders. And so <clears throat> I worked on that for my dissertation. The Black Caucus of the state legislature uh, gave us money to send me to Spain to do the research. And um, when I got back from Spain and had these records, then the archaeologists there could do two years of archaeological work on that site, the first free black town. And um, now there's a we got it made into an underground railroad site, a national park site. Okay. Uh, there's a museum there. Now, when you say hold on, at the site of Fort, of Fort Mose? Yes, sir. Okay, I got you. I got you. And now we have a great museum there. I hope people will go and see it. It's got yeah. a film about the place and you saw Thomas talking about it. Yeah. They reenact the battles and yeah. so on. Let and me stop you there. Let me stop you there. Cause I gotta, I gotta go back to, uh, to this point. Cause I do this okay. with all my guests. Uh, where, where are you, you say you're from where? Well, I'm a Navy brat. So right now I'm teaching at Vanderbilt University but I grew up 
in the Dominican Republic. Oh, really? Hold on, let me stop you there. Then. Did you know Black history in Dominican Republic? Well, yes. I mean, there it's more black than white, of course. Yeah. And um, it's Columbus's first settlement. So I would go into the Catholic Church there and they would say they had Columbus buried there. So a lot of interesting history, but it was always about the Europeans and the indigenous or the natives. Yeah. And I work on the first slave revolt there as well. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm digging out Black history wherever I can find it. And I have the languages to be able to do that research. Okay, so, let me ask you that. How, how did your family get to Dominican Republic? Uh, yeah. Well, I, my dad was probably a spook, naval intelligence. And so they were all over Latin America. And by the time they had us, uh, we end up only in the Dominican Republic and then back to the States. So, but do you go further than him? Did he come from Europe somewhere? Now he's from a little place, one street town, Citronelle, Alabama, near Mobile, Sorda. Okay, hold on. Woo, what a story. We're going to go into this one. <laughs> I'm going to get you where you got to go because you got me rolling. No, we're He goes to what now? Well, he was a bright young guy, apparently a musician. Oh, you would love this, Anthony. He and my uncle would go around the South. Uh, they were both musicians as well as being brilliant. And they would go around the South and collect all the, go to all the juke joints and the black clubs all over the South and record everything. This one funny story they told me uh, was that they go to all these black churches and black clubs and everything. And, and they had to sit in the back of the bus in the back of the church, then behind a little string in this one um, church in Alabama that was Utah Smith and the Tu Wang Temple. And Utah Smith was a black guitarist that they liked. And on Sundays, he would also be the preacher in the I church. I got to ask you this right here. I, I, oh, excuse me for interrupting you. Is he, no, is he black or white? No, he's white. He's white. Okay, so that's the, that's the story right there. He's a white guy that grew up in Alabama. Yeah. And, and, and loved and music. He, he, playing in black joints across the south. Well, he played in clubs and he went to clubs and he went to churches and they recorded music. They wrote music. They played music. And that story about Utah Smith, there are, um, you know, people a lot better informed than I about, you know, the history of this music. But he appears in it. It's spelled E-U-T-A-W, which was the name of the Indian group in Alabama. So he yeah. might have been half Indian, half African-American. Yeah. But he was a great musician, a guitarist, and uh, had a church, the Two Wang Temple. And the Two Wangs were the wings of Mercury, little cardboard wings painted in gold that he would put on the back of his ankles for this gig that he would run on Sundays and play his electric guitar. And they'd sit, what, they had to be in the back row because they were white. And they What would, kind of music would you call it though? What did they call the music? Well, that on Sundays, it was church music. Yeah, yeah, but most, yeah. Mostly they did blues. And so I grew up listening on my mom's side to all the blues that my dad played. And on my, I mean, on my dad's side, the blues that he played and on my mom's side, classical music, so. And you and say, how did, how do you, how did he get to the Dominican Republic? So then he was, he, he knew a lot of languages. He learned a lot of languages when he was in college oh. and they uh, put him in naval intelligence. And so he would be posted at all the different embassies around Spanish America. Oh. Well, now, um, let, let's go back to this. <laughs> uh, when you, when we talk about D Dominican Republic, and, and black people, where does that start? It, from the Europeans bringing them from Africa yes. and enslaving them on the island? But first, that was what I was going to talk about today yes. was yes. the first Please. history yes. of Africans in the Americas is not slavery. It's free black explorers and militiamen and literate people who wrote to the King of Spain and told them all about their service. Like my guy, Francisco Menendez, that I said, you know, fought with the Yamasee Indians, and I don't know his history before that time, but then he comes into Spanish Florida. He was literate. He was a Mandinga man, 
And he writes to the King of Spain and tells him all about his military service and what kind of commissions he wants. And he becomes a black pirate. I've got a big biography I'm working really? on about okay. him. So I could come back later when I have yeah, some. Yeah, of yeah, we got yeah, come back anytime. So now he just he writes a letter. The king gets the letter and says, "Okay, you can go to Dominican Republic." Well, no, uh, I'm sorry. So this is two different stories now okay. because my guy Menendez is much later. He's in the 1700s. Okay. But yeah. but in the early 1500s. All the explorations, and I was going to keep it to North America, but okay. we could go to the Dominican too. Yeah. Because I work on a big Muslim slave revolt there. Um, and, and where? Dominican Republic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, okay, so the Dominican Republic, which was called Española in those days, uh, is where Columbus lands and makes the big settlement. I worked with the same archaeologist down there doing some of that history as well. And um, it's already a, a situation that there were many, many people of African descent free living in Spain and in Portugal who were getting educated, becoming Catholics, doing all kinds of things. So when this opportunity comes to try to become a conqueror of the new world, they join up. And so uh, we find from the 1500s on they're coming across from Spain and Portugal to the New World, they called it. And um, are they on the ship with Columbus? Yeah. And they're on all the other ships that come. Oh. And some are enslaved and some are free militiamen and sailors and explorers. Some are literate, some aren't, you know, yeah. so it varies. But but I pick up, I go for the oldest I can find records for, and then I write about them. Now, when they get there, uh, is it because of the sugar? No, there's no sugar yet. They've just found this place and it's an indigenous place uh, and they have to fight and kill a lot of Indians before they can make their houses there. Um, but what they do find is a little bit of gold at the beginning and much later they'll bring in sugar. They, they have gold and cattle first as as occupations so they're black cowboys they're black gold miners and this happens the same thing so Española is the first island but then they're shooting off to Puerto Rico and to Cuba and to Florida which now, is uh, let's go back a little bit more because you got me on the road we're getting there but Brazil was the first spot wasn't it no it's later uh really? it'll come in later and it'll be the Portuguese that go to Brazil and they they, uh, you know, will only start sugar later. They are first going after uh, dye wood and so on. But yeah, the Caribbean is the first place we see Africans coming into the new world. They call oh, it the really? America. Yeah. And so um, it's a dynamic that you can be free and on the ship with somebody who's enslaved. Exactly. It's not about color, Anthony, in those days. It's about legal status and um, because both Spain and Portugal uh, had a lot of connections to uh, North Africa and the North African Muslims invaded Spain and Portugal. There's 800 years of mixing it up, Jews and Muslims and Christians and uh, Sub-Saharan Africans who were black -er come into Spain and Portugal with those waves of invading armies is the way the Spain and Portugal would look at it. So the Southern parts of Spain and Portugal are heavily, heavily African already before Columbus comes over. And those guys are joining up with all the ships. So this is one of those occurrences where Africans invade uh, other countries. Yeah. Which we, we don't hear about that often at all. Well, it, it happened all over Africa. They were, you know, Africa is, is a continent, but it was never a place that people recognize as home till I guess more modern periods. There they would say they were from the Gambia River or they were from the Sahara or they were, you know, and then they'd get even more precise and say what village they were from and so on. So thousands of languages and places and cultures get sort of lumped together in this term Africa. But if you go 
back, you'll see there were a lot of wars in between each other and uh, where before you might have killed off your enemy, then later when they see there's a market that the English and the French and the Portuguese are running slaves out of, they'll start to sell them to go ship out. Yeah, okay. So, so they, some common um, slave, but I just wanted always to make the point yeah. that there are people with rich, uh, you know, free lives leaving written records for us and that you don't need to start African-American history with 20 odd bedraggled, they say, uh, Africans getting off a boat to become slaves in 1619 in Virginia. That's not the beginning of the history in North America. It's more than a century before that. Hmm. And and that century starts, give us a little bit of when you say what happens at that century. Before okay, that. If, we just, if we move out of the Caribbean, there's the first uh, person that we all can find, the ones of us who work on this, uh, who comes into uh, what is today the United States is a man named Juan Garrido. He uh, was free and African and came from West Africa, we're not exactly sure, into Lisbon first and moves to Seville, joins on a ship and comes into Hispaniola, which we were just talking about. Then he goes with Ponce de Leon to Puerto Rico. Then he goes to Spanish Florida because Ponce de Leon got a, a charter or a contract to go explore North America. So 1513, is when we can definitely say a free black African man named Juan Garrido, who is literate and writes to the king, stepped foot in Florida, the first one we can document. Later, he goes to Cuba and joins up with, an, with Cortez, goes to help conquer the Aztecs in Mexico, goes off looking for black Amazons in California, comes back when he didn't find him to Mexico, and from Mexico, he writes to the king and says, this is what I did for you. Now I want a land grant and I want a job and, you know, so on. Wow. Oh. You, so you take, um, that's the beginning. And so um, I guess this is the first question coming. Getting on them ships wasn't a bad thing at that time. I mean, it, that was the mode of transportation, understandably. Right. was, you know, and then if you got on the ship, sailed somewhat safely from island to island, continent to continent. Yeah, they're explorers and they're multilingual. They could speak different languages. They often are interpreters and very valuable political and military assets to these expeditions. Um, and especially if they can write and do things like that too, that helps them in their future careers. There was somebody, uh, some story uh, in particular that you wanted to talk about today that this leads into that. Isn't well, there? yeah, if we share those, the, the yeah, screen yeah. a little well, bit, yeah, I can yeah. show you some of a little bit of this and then yeah. uh, we'll race through it, I guess. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yes. Does that share there? There we go. Yeah. Is that doing it? That's it. Okay, so let me see. I should do slideshow from beginning. Okay, so I basically, when I teach my classes, I try to show them these are the main, uh, the little red boxes are the main sort of Spanish ports, important ports and cities where we're gonna be able to track Africans in these locations because the Spaniards created a lot of paper trail. Um, they are very litigious. Uh, the one thing that makes all this possible for Africans to become free and have these records is that their legal system was based on Roman law. And it said slavery is an accidental condition, has nothing to do with your skin color or race. If you're captured and somebody sells you as a slave, then we'll say you're a slave. If you aren't killed in a battle, uh, you can become enslaved. If you committed a crime, you could be a slave. Um, you could even sell yourself into slavery in Roman law, anybody, Spaniards could be enslaved, indigenous people could be enslaved, gypsies could be enslaved, uh, all of them, anybody. Okay, and, let me ask you this. What does enslaved mean in practical terms? Well, it means you're not a free person and somebody owns you 
And either it's a private individual or the state, there were royal slaves sometimes too, that the state owned you. And um, it means you don't have freedom of will or movement or anything else. So it's like slavery, like we know, except you're not in a plantation somewhere maybe. So somebody um, else controls your life. Yeah, you are that person's slave. And some people sold themselves into slavery because they were desperate or poor or whatever and thought it would be a better life. Um, you know, there was slavery practiced all in Africa too. So you become like a dependent maybe if you're in an urban household, you're part of the family by extension, but you aren't free. Until you buy your freedom, you could do that. Or until your owner frees you because they wanna do a good Christian charitable act. Uh, sometimes they would, uh, you know, free little babies just as they were born to the enslaved mother. Or sometimes if they're about to die, they'll leave a last will and testament freeing everybody because that'll help them get into heaven, you right. know? So it's a different idea about slavery and it's not permanent for the rest of your life, you have other ways out. And it's not based on race or skin color. It's based on legal conditions only. Okay. So it's a lot different than the Anglo world, the English world, yeah. where it's all about property. Yeah. You have no rights, you have no family, you have no chance at education. They don't even want you in the churches, that kind of thing. It's totally different system. So that's what I'm teaching a lot. My my career is teaching okay. that kind of history and writing and researching it. Now this, so this one is the Spanish Caribbean. So here's, we, yeah, because Spain's the only what Spain claimed it all. And it's later that the English will come in chipping away pieces and the Dutch and the French and so on, as Spain gets weaker and weaker over the centuries. Let me ask you this, was, uh, if you rate, who, who, who did the most something uh, ex exploration and ownership, I guess I'm putting all that in. Was it Spain, Portugal, the, the English? Spain and Portugal were global. So you could find this same system. I have black militiamen in the Philippines because Spain owned it, that are free, that are literate, that design their own uniforms, talk about their military service in the Philippines. In, and Portugal also goes all the way around the world. So in Goa, in India, you know, there's Portuguese with this kind of Roman legal system. Okay. And then the English come in late and it's a little island of what I jokingly call pink people who didn't have much connection to Africa or hundreds of years of this kind of different system. And they work their system of slavery on chattel slavery, which means property and they, property rights are everything, not human rights. Uh, who, 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 who does the most devastation, if you want to call it that, I don't know, let's use that word for like a, uh, in Africa, among those countries, those European countries? Well, they are only on the coast at the beginning, so they've got to be nice and make treaties and pay rent if they want to run any slaves out of there. They've got to figure out the local politics, and they're the ones that are the beggars of the contracts, not the Africans. But way, way later in the 19th century, you'll see occupation of different parts of Africa, like the Belgian Congo, horrible, horrible. Mm -hmm. But in this initial phase, the African kings are in charge. Oh, okay. 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 So, but Spanish was a big player. Well, Spain really didn't have the right to go down to Africa. The Catholic Pope said only Portugal should. So Portugal's running the business, but they're bringing the slaves in uh, to the lower part of Spain and Portugal. And from there, they can go anywhere. Okay. All right. I got you. All right. Uh, maybe should I go another slide? Yeah, 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 please. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was just to set us up in terms of, so I went through all these 1600, 16th century expeditions through what is our country today. And there are Africans with each of these expeditions. So I mentioned Juan Ponce de Leon, who comes in 1513 to Florida, free African man with him. I'll show you his picture in a minute. Mm -hmm. Lucas Vasquez de Ayon, 1526 to a place called San Miguel de Gualdape, which we think is around South Carolina. Africans there rose up and rebelled and ran off to live among the Indians. We lose track of them when there's no Spaniards to write about them. 
So from 1526 at least, and really from 1513 probably, African indigenous people are getting in contact. And Panfilo de Narvaez, Hernando de Soto, Tristan de Luna, these are some of the early expeditions, all of which had African people with them, some enslaved and some free. Okay. So just to say, we don't start in 1619, we're yeah, more than a century lovely. before. Right. Okay, so the Aztec Indians were very interested in these black conquistadors is what another scholar, Matthew Restall calls them. And this man here is Juan Garrido. He went with Hernando Cortez and his indigenous consort, Doña Marina, on this expedition, the Indians are in the back carrying all the heavy load. He's a guide, explorer, linguist, literate. He's the one that I said came from West Africa to Lisbon to Seville, and then is on all these expeditions. And the Aztecs found them interesting because they didn't look exactly like the Spaniards, but they dressed like them and they're with them. So they would paint him. And I've, we've found some uh, images of them the Aztecs put in their picture books. Here's another one. Um, and so the Spaniards all look in their armor and everything, but they make a point of talking or painting him in specific, and also the indigenous woman that helps Cortez. Okay. And there's another one. So I've been able to, we've been able to find three different images the indigenous people drew of this same man who then writes this long petition to the King of Spain, telling about every place he went, what he did and what he wants for it. And this was a standard practice. All those other Spanish conquerors would also write these kinds of, they call them merits and services. It's like a resume basically, or your military you know, papers. Here's where I went, here's what I did, here's what I saw, now what I want. And so we have his petition. This is, you know, he came in 13. So what's that? 25 years later, he's writing from Mexico uh, to get some, you know, some better positions. Okay. And then I mentioned Lucas Vasquez de Ayon, the explorer, comes out of Española or the Dominican Republic. And he gets a contract to go exploring farther north on the uh, continent of North America. And he makes a place called San Miguel de Gualdape. It's, it's Georgia, South, South Carolina line, sort of. Okay. And nobody's excavated or found it yet, but we do have records. And it's the site of the first known slave revolt in our country, 1526. And some of those were enslaved Africans he bought, brought with him to build the place. So they're the first settlers also. But there's a sort of a a squabble among the Spaniards and a civil war, if you want to say it, among the Spaniards and the Africans join in on one side and run off to live with the Wale Indians. Um, so we still need to find that place. But I did a talk for Ann Chin, the Middle Passage Markers Group about this and everything I could find. And I'm not the only one that's working on it. Yeah. They still don't know where it is and different maps show different potential spots, but it's somewhere Georgia, South Carolina. And you see Florida, if this is an old map, but the whole point of Florida is that it juts down into the Caribbean, into the heart of all these other islands. It's close to get to, it's connected to everything, even though it didn't have any big Indian populations or gold or anything worth, you know, fighting for just location, you know? Okay. So again, a next one big expedition, is this uh, Panfilo de Narvaez and Cabeza de Vaca are two guys who start off in the Saint in Española, uh, today's Dominican Republic, to Cuba, uh, going around Cuba up the side of Florida. They have a, a, a shipwreck here, and they make these little boats or you know crafts, and survive a few of them about. And one of them is a uh, uh, a Spanish African named Esteban Dorantes, who survives this whole trek, look at where all they go, before they're discovered and finally make it down to Mexico. He's years in exploring. He was a linguist, he was a healer, and uh, he leaves his story with the Viceroy of Mexico, who sends him on another expedition 
up into the Southwest here where he supposedly uh, is killed, but I always wondered if he didn't just go over to the Indians. But again, this expedition, look how long it took trekking and how much he saw and he survived. Mm. So again, maps that we're trying, all the archeologists and historians are trying to figure out exactly where these people went and where these expeditions went. So if they left chain metal or weapons along the way that the Indians pick up and save, sometimes the archeologists find it. And sometimes we have maps, sometimes we have records, you know? So it's gotta be a joint effort, you know, to get this story. Oops, did I go Let back? me stop you there. So uh, okay. like when the first guy gets here, on the exhibition, uh, fifteen thirteen, I think it was. Uh huh. Uh, is he by himself, or uh, uh, he? Has... No, he, he's part of the crew. I mean, he's with everybody else. He's not a sole explorer. Right. He came yeah. with the expedition of Juan Ponce de Leon, and the way it would work was some man get uh, usually Spanish uh, got the contract. Basically, it's called a capitulación, and uh, the king approves that you can go and. Uh, you know, explore this, and then you're supposed to start new towns, convert everybody, and claim it for Spain. And so all of these people that start these expeditions, well, they need help. They'll get sailors, they'll get, uh, you know, crewmen, they'll do, find useful people who have skills like, you know, um, you know, they might be iron makers, or, you know, blacksmiths, or they might be something else or they might just have a lot of languages and know a lot about geography, who knows, but everybody was supposed to get a cut at the end of the explorations. Mm -hmm. um, and so okay. there- So let me back up here, the, 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 stay on the screen, but let me back up. So okay. now Christopher Columbus uh, was an explorer that had people on the boat with him. Yes. Black and white people, free and not free people. Well, we don't know much about those. There's only a few references and oftentimes they would just say Africans and they wouldn't give a name. So if they were not literate, the chances are if they were not literate and didn't write records about it, um, then maybe they were enslaved on the Columbus voyage. But this okay. 1513, we know him because he did, he's educated, literate, writes to the king and so on. And so we know his story better. Okay. Now, uh, the, but uh, I want to get to this just a, just a tad. Columbus is not a good guy. I, I got a lady on the channel who lives in Columbus, Ohio, that says we took his statues down. Columbus well, he, was, he along the way, he was doing some atrocities. Is that correct? Yeah, he waged war against all the indigenous groups in Hispaniola, big wars. But the main thing is when these Europeans come in and these Africans from Europe, uh, they're bringing in diseases that the Indians had never been exposed to before, and that does the most damage of all. A smallpox, yellow fever, uh, yeah, even a flu. If they'd never been exposed to flu, it wipes out many, many, many people. But was he also raping some of the women or something? Oh, well, I'm sure. It's never been, there's no proof of that. Nobody reported it or recorded it, but... Uh, you know, I, so I shouldn't say I'm sure, but it's not unlikely. So why, okay, why did, why would Columbus, Ohio take down his statue? Because well, of because what? Because he killed all the indigenous people. Oh, oh, so that's his real crime. Yeah. The rape might have been something, but we know he did that. Yeah, I have I mean, there are lots and lots of books written about Columbus, and I have never read a specific incident of, you know, that you could document, but you sure can say uh, he wasn't trying to kill them. He was fighting his way down the island to try to claim it. But he, you know, he did terrible. Uh, he wasn't the worst of the, he's not really a warrior. He was a poor Italian wool maker, his family. They're not warriors. He's an explorer. Um, his brother, he leaves in charge because he wants to go exploring, find more things. He gets shipwrecked in Jamaica. I mean, so he's he's not a very actually not a very, you know, he doesn't conquer a big empire like Cortez conquers the Aztec empire right. or Pizarro conquers the Peruvian Inca empire, but he is the first and he's exploring and he's so that's, that's doing a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he wanted to just keep going. He wanted to find 
do you remember the story about Marco Polo was a European Italian who ends up in China and finally comes back to Europe and he writes these books about everything so marvelous in China. Columbus wanted to get to China. He accidentally runs into the Americas. Oh, okay. Nobody knew this whole con the, you know, North and South America was there till he hit it accidentally. Oh, and the first place Columbus hit was what? Espanola is where he's gonna well he he is the Dominican at, Republic. Yeah, that's where he establishes himself. He saw some other little islands in the Caribbean, but his settlement is the first settlement is. I, I got one more question. So he's on a boat and he just sails that way. Yeah. And whatever comes up is what happens because there's no way of knowing because no one knows what's there. That's right. It was, well, here's the, you know, he, they considered the Spanish considered this was God showed him the way, you know, first, oh, they, got de you. first they defeated the Muslims after almost 800 years. And then that same year, since Isabella isn't fighting Muslims anymore, she gives Columbus this contract to go exploring. He's talked her into it. And, but he thinks he's going to go to China and Japan and the Orient, as they used to say. He accidentally hits this, but he's going to claim it for Spain. And then they say, see, this is a wonderful, another act of God. Oh. Okay, yeah. So now what's the next uh, slide? Okay, you know, so Cabeza de Vaca and with Esteban, who survives and then eventually gets sent up there. Uh, and then the next one, Hernando de Soto, 1539 to 42. He had been in the big conquest of the Inca world in Peru, and he gets rich, and he asks for a contract for himself. Now, and here's where he lands in the south, uh, I mean, the west side of Florida, treks. And again, we're sort of piecing this together from documents and archaeology. Goes all the way up into North Carolina, all the way back down. He ends up dying on alongside the Mississippi River. Oh, first, I'm sorry, he went over here and comes back and dies on the Mississippi River. And um, they put him, they float his body into the river and the few survivors after all of this trekking around float down the Mississippi River. And one of the survivors is an African-American woman who was a slave on all of this. So um, hmm. again, long before 1619, okay? All right, you, you rolling. <laughs> <laughs> Same point. De Soto was a terrible, he was horrible, horrible to the indigenous. He burned up people. He cut off arms and legs and feet and so on. He was after the money. And they had done the same kind of thing in Peru in the Inca uh, conquest. So there was a big, huge battle in Mobile. What is, well, the Mobila Indians close to Mobile, but that's why Mobile's called that. And uh, he was a terror. Another, again, we try to get the expeditions. The next one was Coronado. Here's some of his. So all of these people had Africans with them exploring, suffering the same hardships that the Spaniards did. Some of them in the work, my first book was called Black Society in Spanish Florida. And I tracked who stayed with the Spaniards and who ran and stayed with the Indians. And usually if it was free African men, who were explorers and could claim Spain's, you know, promises, they usually stayed with the expeditions. But people who were enslaved often thought their best chance was living with the Indians and they would maybe escape off to live with the Indians, like the people that I looked at at San Miguel de Gualdape. So um, sometimes the next expedition would come and they'd try to retrace the path of the last one and they'd say, whatever happened to, and they'd name the African man that had been left behind because he was sick or whatever. And they say, oh, he lived here 10 years with us. And then when he died, we buried him. You know, he'd become an Indian by this time, practically. You know, so okay. just to say they're all over the place. And then this is a little bit past your, our, our talk, but all this to say that they found silver in Mexico and Peru, the two big areas of conquest. So they start a whole fleet system that's gonna keep going back and forth to Spain to take that loot home. Always on all those ships, Africans too.
okay? Some enslaved, some free, moving through the world. So they're not barefoot in a cotton patch somewhere. Okay. They're learning languages, they're moving through worlds and um, they're learning a lot and they're valuable because they know so much. But let me ask you this, is it, now, uh, maybe this is not a good question, maybe it is. Uh, the people that are the, the, the run the exploration, they're mostly all white. Is that well, okay. yeah, they don't call themselves white, they call themselves Spanish or Portuguese. Right, right. They could be mixed too, who knows? Oh, really? But not these particular ones that I'm looking at, but okay. because 800 years of Africans living in these cities, there's a lot of intermarriage and mixed race children and all that okay. before you can get to the Americas. Okay. This one here, Juanillo, is somebody that when the first Spanish that gets a contract to make a settlement at Florida, not just explore, is a man named Pedro Menendez de Aviles. Um, when he gets to Florida near St. Augustine, he starts to say, well, I got to see what's happening in the rest of this, my territory here. And he goes down and he finds this man who'd been living eight years on the coast of Florida as a shipwreck victim that went to live with the Indians. And of course, that's really valuable because he's lived eight years with the Indians. He knows their customs, the language, he's literate, uh, and he gets incorporated into Menendez's militia. And so we did a museum exhibit when I was working on Mose. Uh, and so I don't really know what he looked like, but the artist drew him like this. And my, one of my things I'm happy and proud about is that all of our, all of this research that I've done is now part of the required fourth grade textbooks. So like you say, it's important that kids know their history and know that they weren't all just enslaved and, yeah. you know, uneducated and whatever. Oh, I love it. You have to know that story too, of course, but my yeah, sure. ex expertise is in this. And I think it's good for kids to know you, you had brave explorers and you had people who could speak a lot of languages and had a lot of skills and uh, you know, demanded their rights of the Spanish king and that kind of thing. I think that's important for kids. Yeah, me too. I, I never knew. Now, let this, so how about this? How, 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 does, how does it make you feel, and you've done it so long now, that you see one of these documents that gives you this information? Oh, I love it. This is what I live for. You know, I'm digging all the time. And I've got a wonderful group of graduate students who are now some of them young profs and writing their beautiful books. One is very important, I, I would think your uh, watchers might like, is called Atlantic Africa by David Wheat. And he is better than I am at this early script that you, I showed you the picture of the document, it's hard. Um, and he's written a wonderful book doing a lot of research on the African, uh, earliest African settlements and then out into the islands and then, you know, all through the Caribbean. So a lot of young scholars are now doing this work and filling in the missing pieces, I called it, of the missing century. Okay, let me ask you this then. What, and you, and you might have shown this, but what does a document look like? It's a piece of paper that has not withered away yeah, and it but, tells yeah. this story. It, it is. And, you know, that's the other thing we think about the, in the English system, not many people were allowed to be educated. And so they couldn't leave records. And if you look at an English record about slavery, they'll just have a first name and they'll have a list of the slaves on that place. First name only. It'll never show you their family groupings. And next list might be a list of the cows and the pigs, whatever. It's their property focus and you don't have anything like that. But here we have, you were not, even if you enslaved people, you were not allowed to sell away families. Everybody had to stay together, the family unit. Oh, really? and, um, yeah, and if anybody was excessively cruel, they could be reported and they could be punished. The, the white owner, uh, it doesn't mean that somewhere off in the boondocks that didn't happen, but it just meant that by law, I always say the doubly disempowered person you might think about would be a woman enslaved. But I have enslaved women writing to the King of Spain and saying, you know, I need your help. Uh, is there one of a black guy who ended up with a lot of land? Oh yeah, you know, uh, in, in my book, that black society book in Spanish Florida, 
um, that was uh, one of the ways they, the Spanish crown, when it didn't have as much resources in the early 1800s, they would pay uh, the, the volunteer black militia with land grants. And, um, you know, so the, my book has about black landowners, black business people, women who own property and land, uh, like Anna Kingsley. Um, and then you can follow when the Americans come in, they don't want to allow free blacks to have those kinds of, you know, benefits or rights. And you'll start to see that even after Spain leaves and said they were supposed to protect everybody, the Americans said they would in Louisiana and in Florida, but they don't. And they start acquiring a lands that, but I was on a, a a panel one time up at the Smithsonian with this wonderful woman who asked me about one of her ancestors and he's in my book because they had land and property and uh, again, literate, schooled, okay. all of that. That, that, that. that led to what I was going to ask you next. Have you tracked anybody that was one of these early explorers and have tracked their family back to maybe even today or some, you know what I mean? Well, not that far back, not as far back, 300 years here we're talking, but 18th century from the 1790s, I wrote another book called Atlantic Creoles in the Age of Revolutions. And each chapter is about a revolutionary war hero of some kind that I could find a lot of these records on. So one is a man named Big Prince Whitten who ran from South Carolina in the American Revolution and gets into Florida and becomes a uh, a militiaman, He's, he did not know how to write, but his children go to school there and learn how to write. And lots of his documents are written by somebody else and he'll sign with an X, but he knows his rights and he goes to court all the time. And so does his wife, Judy. And so he ends up fighting the Americans when they come in in 1812 and defeats a little US Marine operation that Americans trying to push the Spaniards out because they don't want this kind of freedom to be on the you know southern side of their plantations because mm -hmm. slaves will just keep running to get free across the, the river and get into Spanish Florida. So from the minute they start getting pretty powerful, the Anglos up in South Carolina and Georgia, they're pushing on Spain. Don't let those runaways come in. Uh, you know, if you want our friendship in the American Revolution, you better cut it out. And eventually they do say, we won't accept any more runaways. No, oh, really? Is, yeah. that, is that something with uh, Fort Negro? The Negro Fort, you mean in Apalachicola River? Yes. Yes, I'm writing about, I have, I have written about that too. Some of my runaways, once this door is shut and they can't make land in St. Augustine anymore, they'll run to live instead with the Seminole Indians. So um, I work on the black Seminoles and some of them end up uh, in the Apalachicola Negro Fort, they, the English called it that. Uh, then I'm tracking them up to the Suwannee River where they live in their own towns aside the Seminole towns. And some of them are literate and so on. And one of the guys I'm writing about now Survived all that, but Andrew Jackson in the first Seminole War captured him, brought him up here to Nashville where he was re-enslaved on the Hermitage plantation that Andrew Jackson owns here. And again, they interpret it as if it's you know gone with the wind, but here's this man who I found, his parents ran from Georgia into Florida. He's a baptized Catholic. I have all his records. He ends up joining the British in the War of 1812, ends up at the Negro Fort. When the US Navy blows that up, they run to the Seminole villages. And he's one of the heroes that helped defend that community to let the women and children escape across the river. And that's why he and some others are captured by Andrew Jackson. Hmm. And- um, Oh boy, I got an expert on the channel today. <laughs> and here's our, my team that I take these are the oldest records for Africans in the United States. This is what they look like. These records are, you know, hundreds of years old. They are fragments, some of them. These people put them in plastic, which they shouldn't have. But then I have to take my students who can read Spanish 
uh, down with me. We digitize all of them and then I put it up for everybody to see online and to make use of. So 1590s are for the oldest in our country, but I also have preserved from Cuba at about the same time, all the African records for Cuba, Colombia, Brazil, Cape Verde, Benin, I take them everywhere. And so uh, these are my, some of my gang for that trip. Mm. And then this, this wow. is what I put up for everybody who wants to look. So some people do try to track their ancestry through this. So mostly our big collections are Brazil, Cuba, Colombia, and Spanish Florida. But um, we're starting to get some from little pieces of things from um, Angola, and, oops, sorry, Angola and um, Benin and where else? And Cape Verde are my African uh, locations. So that's the end of my slides. And I hit on these records when I was in graduate school. And then the Black Caucus uh, legislature helped me help by financing me to go and do this research. So I'm indebted to them always. And uh, to my professor, the archeologist Kathleen Deegan, who trained me and, and to the historians who trained me. And now I'm training my kids, my grads, and they're training other students. And they're all committed to doing what we can with the oldest languages and documents that we can, because other people can do the English material and we're doing Spanish and Portuguese primarily. You, 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 so uh, I'm gonna brag on you one more time. So you've been where? You've been throughout Africa, you've been throughout Europe yeah. looking for these stories. Can you give us an idea of some of the countries, that kind yeah. of thing? Okay, Morocco, Senegal, Ghana, Togo, I just drove through, Benin, and Kenya are my African countries. And in Spain and Portugal is where I do most of the research. And then in the Caribbean, Cuba and the Dominican Republic. And then I go to Brazil because that was a hugely African place too. And Colombia, uh, research all through all those places. Uh, have you written a book? Yet? This was my first one, Black Society in Spanish Florida. Okay. You see this man? Yep. He's a Mina. He's from the Mina nation around the Gold Coast of Ghana. And uh, so in the back of that, there's all kinds of appendices about the individual people in their military units and their families and their baptisms and so on. That was my first book, the one that okay. the Black Caucus helped me with, where I talked about that town. Yeah. And this is the other big one that I did called uh, Atlantic Creoles in the Age of Revolution. This is a man, George Biasu. To, everybody knows Tucson Louverture, but yeah. he came late to the game. This guy, he was under this guy, Georges Biasu. And um, the fascinating thing about him, he's from the Dominican Republic where I am, well, actually now Haiti. Um, after the Spaniards uh, come into this story that people don't know really, he becomes, uh, he writes to the king too. He can't really write, but people write for him. He's a black militiaman for Spain, just like some of my other guys. And he gets medals and honors and so on. But at the end of the revolution, all of the black auxiliaries who helped win independence get sent out um, because France doesn't want them there. And this man comes to Florida and he's buried in Spanish Florida. So I had him in my first book too, George Biasu. And I have had some of his relatives write me and I give them all the information I can about their relative who's buried there, who had an amazing career as one of the most important revolutionaries in the French Revolution, who knew Toussaint from childhood and they corresponded and so on. And once he leaves out, Toussaint Louverture stays behind and decides he's going for uh, get rid of the French too and become independent. And that, 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 well, I think one more good, good one. How about this one? When you go to these places, you vacation just a second, don't you? I mean, you get on the <laughs> beach and you you lounge and you drink in uh, Mai Tais and, you know, whatever, you know, I mean. I was so say I didn't have that, a drink or two. <laughs> yeah, so that, what I'm saying is you got to love what you're doing. Because you. You, you've seen the world, you get there, you do some work and you enjoy hearing the culture and the background of these places. Yeah, I do. I mean, I, uh, 
I love it. I do it because I love it. And, um, and sort of feel like I was meant to. Yeah, it. I love it. Where but I'm too pink to hang out on the beach at Anthony. Yeah. Well, what, what's your website? Oh, uh, slavesocieties.org. Okay. Is for the big archive. I don't really have an, a, a website of my own. So that's how people can find your books and that kind of thing to buy? Oh, if they just Google Jane Landers, I think you'd see them all. I have some things like TEDx talks and things they could find too. Okay. If you want to just Google and at Vanderbilt, they have a little page for each of us, but. Okay, yeah. I got you. That's how we can find it and support the books and read them and so on and so forth. Uh, I thank you so very much for coming on the channel. Uh, cause I, and I, I apologize cause I, I was loose cause you was giving me so much. And when you <laughs> gave me something, I wanted to do it. We did it. And then we got back to the point and cause that's cause you that good. That's fine. Oh, However you want to do it, Anthony, yes. it's fine. Um, Man, everybody hit the subscribe button. And I know you got to hit the like button on this one because it took you back further than you know. I know you did. I didn't know. Uh, hit the notifications bell. Tell somebody about strong inspirations. We, the train has left the station and is not coming back. <laughs> There's too much going on. Uh, and to you, I say with all sincerity. I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind. I love what you're doing that you have Thank taken you. it to the next level. Thank you, Anthony. Undoubtedly. Thank and you. Said, and then came up with the, uh, the mantra, this is what I've been put on here to do. You okay. throw it into it and you take in the thing. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. Everybody follow her. Uh, and with that, uh, 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 shucks, is there, can, since you speak Spanish, is there a, a, a way to say goodbye or something like that? You can say adios, amigos. There goodbye, it is. my friends. <laughs> I got you. So with that, I'll say bye-bye. We out. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Anthony. Bye-bye. Uh,